gross domestic product. Let's roll. Today's overarching question is, it's a good idea to put part of your monthly income in a savings account. Agree or disagree? Okay, so take a few minutes, write at least two points for each of the questions there. So you start by recording the slide number, copy the, the statement and say whether you agree or disagree and write two points for incentives, for sacrifices and for alternatives. Whatever comes to your mind, by the end of the lesson, you're going to be much deeper. So you might have heard of GDP. It's really at the center of macroeconomics. It's really our goal. It's kind of like our God in macroeconomics. We always care about GDP and we always assess countries and assess policies based on their impact on GDP. So GDP is the value of all goods and services produced in a country in a year. So it's measured on an annual basis in billions or trillions of dollars. It's the dollar value of all Canadian production. Okay. So what does gross mean? Now you might be like, oh, gross means disgusting, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> I love that cartoon, by the way. Well, not here. That's not gross. Okay, this is more like, uh, think of grow in, in French. So gross here means all, okay, everything, the big picture. So that's what we're looking at. And domestic is the idea of Canadian. So we're talking about things that ha happen inside Canada. And product is their production, right? So gross domestic product simply means all Canadian production. It's also called national income, which is the total income generated in Canada. Its symbol is Y. So you're going to see the symbol Y later. It simply refers to GDP and GDP is the same as national income. And you might be like, hang on, why do you have a stupid symbol Y here? I don't know. Like, I don't know who came up with that, but maybe because I is used for something else or maybe because there is no Y in income. So, but that's, that's the symbol. It doesn't include what was produced last year. So old stuff. This, this, you might want to note it down. Old stuff are not included in GDP. Okay, why? Because they were already included in last year's GDP. Okay, so used products, secondhand, those things are excluded from GDP because you want to avoid double counting. You don't want to double dip. GDP trend over the long run is called growth. So if you look at a country's GDP over the last 10, 15, 20 years, or maybe more, that would be the growth. And it's measured, the GDP is measured by adding up everyone's spending on goods and services produced in Canada this year, right? So that's called aggregate expenditure, AE, and aggregate expenditure is the same as total spending. Okay, so this is kind of important. Aggregate means total and expenditure means spending, right? So pause here, write a, record this slide number. Uh, write a one sentence summary of this slide for yourself and the highlights that you got, uh, write them down. I would say write the symbols uh, like Y and AE down because those are important. All right, so we want to measure GDP and the way we measure it is through the counting out all of the spending. So the question to ask yourself is what are the types of spending that takes place in Canada and who are the people who make these kinds of spending? So start with yourself. What are the things that you buy? And what kind of sector would you classify under? Well, you would be the household sector. So all of the people, all of the households, they spend money. They spend money on, I don't know, all the things like rent, food, clothes, uh, transportation, all of that stuff. So that would be consumption. So anything that's spent by the households, that's classified as consumption. And the symbol for that is C. Who else spends money other than households? Well, other than households, you can think of companies, right? So that's called firms. They also spend money. And the name for the spending is called investment. Okay. So I want to point out something here that's kind of tricky here. In economics, investment is a special term. It's different from everyday sense of it. And it's always associated with firms. So you might want to highlight that or put it start that investment always goes with firms. Okay. Who else spends money other than households and firms? Oh yeah, those big guys, right? The government, right? So for instance, they spend money on roads, right? Or the police or schools and hospitals or the army. So all of that is classified as government purchases and the symbol is G. Is there anyone else who spends money on Canadian goods and services? Well, how about foreigners, right? So foreigners buy from us. What is it called when other countries buy from us? It's called exports, yeah? So what's an example of Canadian exports? Um, I love it. Students always say, oh, maple syrup. Uh, and it makes me laugh because 
that that's that's not really serious. I mean, uh, can't we don't we have any anything better to show for? Like, do we do you run the economy on maple syrup? Well, whatever. Uh, we have actually a lot of exports. We export airplanes and and vehicles and water and electricity. Um, so all of that is classified as export. So this is a very neat way of summarizing what's included in GDP from the expenditure approach, right? So take a minute. I would say for this for this slide, you can simply copy the table that you have and also draw some pictures. So pictures help you uh, retain the material. So for the government, you can do a little maple uh, uh, flag for yourself. Uh, or whatever uh, picture that you like. Okay, so record the slide number and copy this table down for yourself. This is a fun slide. Uh, sometimes my students tell me, sir, you have a very weird definition of fun. Well, no, this one's really fun. So um, think of the, the, the table that we had with the four items. We can actually put them together to get a formula for GDP. So that's called GDP equals aggregate expenditure equals C plus I plus G plus X. So this is the total spending taking place on Canadian goods and services. But hang on, we are missing something. This is an overestimation actually. Why? Think of your own consumption. The things that you buy, are they all produced in Canada? Because remember, GDP, the, the D in GDP stands for domestic, right? So this should only include things that are produced domestically, our own goods and services. Are the things that you buy all produced in Canada? Actually, no, actually a lot of them are not produced in Canada. A lot of them come from China or the States, or if you buy coffee, it comes from Brazil or Colombia or Costa Rica. So you have to exclude those. And the firms also, when the firms buy machinery, uh, a lot of that comes from other uh, places, right? Government also, if the government spends money on the army, the army material, they usually buy it from the States, okay? So what we do is that we have to adjust it, okay? So we, put negative M and that would be subtracting imports to adjust for goods and services produced abroad but purchased by Canadian households, firms and government. Okay, this I, I box it because it's, uh, it's an important formula and we're going to use it over and over again in the course. So make sure you write it down and you highlight it or you box it uh, or put some stars around it because it's a very useful formula in the course. All right. So now to understand GDP better, we have to look at these five items inside the C, I, G, X, M. Okay. So we're going to th go through them one by one. So consumption is basically things that households spend on, including what? Well, one of them is durable goods, right? So durable goods are things that last for a long time, such as appliances, furniture, and cars. So those are a good example of, of durable goods. Now, just to remind you again, this only includes new stuff because old stuff are already included in the last year's GDP. So new cars, new appliances, new whatever. Or semi-durable goods. So these are things that last a little bit, but not too long. So such as clothes, cell phones, and bags, right? Um, now, one thing that I would add here is some, there are some types of cars which are semi-durable, okay? They are known as American cars. Um, so <laughs> non-American cars would be durable. American cars would be durable. Um, if you want, but that's a joke. Um, or on non-durable goods. So non-durable goods would be things like food, cosmetics, and drugs, okay? Or gas for your car, for that matter. And the other item is services. So these services are non-tangible. So the first three are all goods, different types of goods. And services would be things like transportation, electricity, health, and plumbing, all right? So one thing that I want to note here is that most of our spending is actually on services. So it's not really tangible, but it, it's still a, t a type of production. Okay. So out of these things, one, one of them is kind of special and that is durable goods. Okay. And what's special about it is that they are purchased on credit and credit means a loan. So think of it. These are major purchases, right? These are really expensive things. So people usually buy them on a loan and you have to pay interest on it. So as a consumer, because you borrow money, you don't like that. You don't like to pay interest. Interest is an additional cost. And there is an element of long-term planning involved here. Okay, so that's, that's this slide. Uh, record this slide number, write a one sentence summary of what you learned in this slide and also some of the main highlights, including the formula. Wow, did you see that? It shattered. All right, so moving on, we have investment, which is invest, uh, spending by firms in their business. 
Okay, this is financed by borrowing. So usually firms borrow money to put in their uh, firm, their business, and which means that when they borrow, they have to pay interest. So again, we get this sad little guy because interest means an additional cost. And there is an element of long-term planning. You're going to see why I, I emphasize this, the idea of interest and long-term planning. We're going to see that, that they're going to be, it's going to be a uh, very important concept later. The G stands for government purchases, and that's when the government buys goods and services. This, by the way, includes all levels of government. So the federal, the provincial, the municipal. So for instance, construction, maintenance, consultation. So goods and services bought by the, by the government. So a word of caution here is, it does not include transfer payments. Okay, so what is transfer payment? So here's the thing, guys. Government has two types of spending. There are sometimes things that government buys, like goods and services, like what you see as examples, and there are things that the government pays for free. So those free payments are transfer payments. Okay, so when the government, this, this is the assistance, for instance, to a firm or a household. Um, it's not in exchange for a good or service. GDP is only stuff for goods and services. That's the whole point of it. So this is about production. The transfer payments are not for production. So it's not going to be part of GDP. So this can be a trick question if you get it on a test or an assignment. Transfer payments are not part of GDP because they do not represent new production. So examples of that would be welfare or subsidies or bursaries. So you have seen subsidies before. So those are things that farmers get, for instance, and that's the same as a negative tax. So it's the opposite of a tax. So here's the interaction between the government and the private sector. So the private sector, you see it in a box. It includes both households and firms. There are two things going on. One of them is that the private sector, including both firms and households, pay taxes to the government. And sometimes the government pays transfer payments to the households and firms or to some people. So those are them who are in need. OK, so the, you see that they are the opposite of one another. OK, so pause here for, uh, and write this slide number and write one sentence summary in your own words and also a few notes. Exports are things that foreigners buy from us. So things produced in Canada purchased by foreigners. So yeah, you're good old maple syrup. Good luck with that. Um, so some, some real serious exports of Canada are oil, lumber, and tourism. Um, imports are the opposite of that. So that's when the Canadians purchase foreign goods and services. So for instance, fruits, electronics, cell phone apps. And also I want to point out a couple of things here. One is that there is, an, there is some overlap. So for instance, cars. We export cars and we import cars. Oil also, we export oil and we also import oil, depending on the region and the type that you're talking about. So that's not a contradiction. Another thing is the idea of services. Most of our exports and most of our imports are in the form of services. So it's not tangible. So this is a common mistake by students. They think that export is when something physically ships out. That's not the only type of exports. Most of exports, there is no physical shipment. The idea is that as long as a foreigner spends on our goods and services, so in, including services, that would be uh, export. So tourism is a form of export, even though nothing is, is, is shipping out. So if, if someone comes here, let's say Niagara Falls or, or Montreal, and they don't buy any souvenir, they just stay in our hotels, that still is an export. Anyway, another concept here is net exports, which is a country's trade balance. Okay. So it's a simple formula, just X minus M. Those are the last two items in our formula, that is net exports. If the exports are greater than imports, we call that a trade surplus. So that would be a positive net exports. If exports is less than imports, that would be a trade deficit. So that would be a negative uh, net exports. Um, it, it's also, it kind of sounds like the positive means good, negative means bad, but that's a fallacy actually. And later on, you're going to see why this is a fallacy. So before we move on, pause, record this slide number, write your sentence and some notes. Another relevant concept here is disposable income. That is income after taxes and deductions. This is what goes into your pocket or purse. And that would be available for two things, either consumption or saving. Okay. Now you look at this disposable, what does disposable mean? Yeah. Some of you might be like, oh, it means like disposable cups. No, that's not the meaning here. You don't want to dispose it. The idea here is, have you heard of when something is at your disposal? What does it mean when they say this is at your disposal? 
at your disposal means available. So disposable income means available income. A good way of remembering that is remember the French. It's disponible. That's what it is. So disposable income is available income. It's available for those two items. All right. And we have some formula here. One of them is that disposable income equals your total income minus taxes. So the Y is your gross income or total income, which is the same as GDP for the whole country if you include everyone. And the T is all of the taxes, all of the taxes and deductions. Okay. So that's where disposable income comes from. It comes from your total minus taxes. Where does it go into? It goes into two things, either consumption or saving. So if you add up your consumption and saving, you get your disposable income. So you have two formulas. These are two different formulas, but both of them are related to disposable income. So when you write down your notes, make sure you write both of them down and you highlight them or you box them. And let's look at some example. So your gross monthly income is $1,500 and the total deductions are 300. Your disposable income is you have to find that out using the formulas given. Now, if you save 10% of that, you will be saving how much and consuming how much per month. And if your disposable income doubles, other things being equal, so the 10% is still 10%, then what happens to your saving and what happens to your consumption? So pause here, write a one sentence summary here. Um, make sure you write down the formulas and also answer those ABC questions in your notebook. So you need to punch in some numbers. You can also do it in your head. It's not too hard and uh, your notes must be complete. Wow, that was cool. So savings are part of your disposable income that is not spent. It's set aside for future. So you have to think about the incentives. Why is it that people save? Well, they, they want to have some backup, basically, right? It's a source of confidence. And a good example of that is wealth, right? So here's the thing. Income is something that you earn every month, every two weeks, for instance. Wealth is what you have accumulated out of that over the, over the past, you know? So we have a distinction between consumption and saving. Consumption means you enjoy your money today. Saving means you enjoy your money tomorrow right so you have to choose between when you, when you have any amount of money you have to choose whether you enjoy it today or you enjoy it tomorrow and what is it called when you choose something and you sacrifice something yeah opportunity cost so there's an opportunity cost between consumption and saving so let's look at one example if people start feeling insecure for whatever reason if they're insecure about the future their saving is going to and their spending is going to, so you have to fill in the blanks there and you have to predict what happens to consumption and saving, right? So the consumption is gonna drop and saving is gonna increase, right? So that's how they respond to this event. That's the incentives involved here. So pause here and write your sentence summary and maybe the, the table there and some highlights of this slide. There's an important clarification to make here. There's a difference between investment and saving. All right. So in economics, as I said, we use investment with a very special meaning, which is different from everyday sense of it. So we're going to look at what uh, what the difference is. Investment is always by firms, whereas saving is by households. So this is kind of useful. Anything that you guys do as households, that's called saving. OK, even if in, in, in everyday language, you might say investing, that's not investment in economic sense. Economics, economically speaking, investment is always by firms. It goes into the business. It's an, there is an element of borrowing in investment. The firms borrow money in order to invest. In saving, it is exactly the opposite. It's a form of lending. When you save your money, you're practically lending it to someone. So because you borrow in you know, invest, investment is a form of borrowing, they have to pay interest on it. Because saving is a form of lending, they will earn interest on it. So you can see again, those are exactly opposite. Investment goes into production because it goes into the businesses, whereas saving doesn't go into production. Not directly, at least. OK, so investment would be part of GDP, whereas saving would not be part of GDP. All right. So here's an example for you. Investing in stocks or investing in the bank. These are the things that we use in everyday language, right? So the question is, are these forms of investment or are these forms of saving? So what do you think? Do they qualify for the green column or for the pink column? Are these things that are done by the firms or by you as a household? And are these forms of borrowing or forms of lending? Are these things that pay interest or that earn interest? 
right? So these things that we use in everyday language are actually forms of saving. So economically speaking, anyone who does these things, they are actually saving, they're not investing. Investment is always by the firms. So you might, always, you might, we might as well just change the expression. Instead of saying investing, you can say buying stocks or depositing or saving in the bank, all right? Let me give a note on, on stocks. When you buy stocks, you are basically owning a share of the company. Have you heard of shareholder, right? So become a shareholder. So effectively, you're buying a brick in the company's wall. That's really what it means to buy a stock. A stock is a change of ownership, not a new production. Okay, so when you buy stocks, there is no new production. You're just changing owners. The stock already existed before. And remember, the old stuff are not included in GDP. Okay, so one of the reasons why in economics we don't really talk about stocks too much is because stocks are old stuff. They're not part of GDP. Um, something that's useful in, the, in terms of long run, savings are the source of funds for investment, right? So because when you save your lending and then the firms borrow that and becomes their investment. Okay, so there's kind of like a cycle between investment and saving. What I have to emphasize here is this element of borrowing, okay? So we're going to see later why it's important, but whenever you see the word investment associated with borrowing, okay, they go hand in hand, okay? Um, so record your slide number and your one sentence summary before we move on. Now some of you are like, hang on, what about GNP, right? So we're going to talk about the difference between GDP and GNP. The gross domestic product is the market value of all goods and services produced in Canada, regardless of by who, regardless of who is the producer. All income generated in Canada. So the difference between them is really geographic, as we're going to see. The GNP, the N stands for national, gross national product. This is the market value of all goods and per services produced by Canadian resources, regardless of where they are. Okay, so if the production takes place inside Canada, that's part of our GDP. If the production takes place by Canadian resources, wherever they are, inside or outside, then that would be GNP, okay? So that would be the value of income received by Canadians, not generated in Canada, but received by Canadians, okay? So as we're gonna see, the, the Venn diagram, there's gonna be an overlap between them. So one thing that I wanna, before we go on with examples, one thing that I wanna emphasize, this is all geographic. There are things that are GDP, there are things that are GDP or both. And what we have here is GDP is about the beginning of production. It's about where it happens. GNP is about the end. It's about where the money goes. So if you look at the production itself, it's GDP. If you think of the income generated from it, it's GNP. So let's look at an example. Uh, there is an overlap between them, but sometimes there is no overlap. So for instance, a hotel in, a hotel in Mexico that's owned by a Canadian firm, right? Now, is that the, it's producing a service, right? It's a recreation or tourism service. Does that take place inside Canada? No, it's taking place in Mexico. So it's not part of our GDP. However, it is part of our GNP because the owner is Canadian. So the resource is owned by Canadians. So that would be a green section in the diagram. How about a Dodge plant in Ontario, right? Now Dodge is a Canadian company, uh, is, is, is not a Canadian company, it's an American company but it's positioned in Ontario, it's inside Canada. So because it's taking place inside Canada, it would be part of our GDP, but because the owner is not Canadian, it's not part of GNP. Now, part of it actually is, is part of GDP because some of the owners, some of the workers are Canadian, but some of the stockholders are not Canadian, so it's gonna leave the country, okay? So that's gonna be part of GDP, but not GNP, all right? And again, I wanna emphasize that most things are actually in the middle section. Most, th most things are produced in Canada by Canadian goods and service, uh, by, by Canadian owners. Now you might be like, hang on, which one is better? Is GDP better or GNP better? And the answer is really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for how easy it is to find a job or how much factories are working and producing or the level of construction, then GDP is better. If you're looking for how much income there is, available to the residents, then GNP is better, okay? So this is not a matter of citizenship, it's, it's just simply a geographical distinction. For Canada, uh, the foreign investment in our country is higher than our investment abroad, okay? So our GDP is a little bit higher than our GNP. All right, so pause here and record the slide number and your sentence and some notes. One of the reasons why we care so much about GDP is that it, it's a measure of standard of living, which is really important. 
Standard living is the quantity and quality of goods and services available to the people. The level of comfort, of ease, of material well-being that we have. All right. So here's a question for you. Let's compare Canada versus China. Which country do you think has a higher GDP? Now, you can imagine uh, China has a lot higher GDP. Actually, it has the second highest GDP in the world after the US, right? Now, here's the second question. Where do you think the standard of, li standard of living, the comfort level is higher in Canada or in China? Well, actually, it's actually much higher in Canada. So you might be like, hang on, how is that possible? They have more GDP, but less standard of living. So what's going on here? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. Think about the population. Where do you have more population? A lot more in China than in Canada, right? A lot more. So the idea here is GDP per capita. So GDP itself is not that important. What matters more is GDP per capita. So per capita, cap means head. So GDP per capita is, has a simple formula of GDP over population. So this is really an, an average formula. So it's, the, it's, it's how much on average a person is making in the country. So this accounts for different population size and you can compare between countries with different populations, right? So this width is, this is width. Um, that's why it's useful because you can use it for comparison. Higher GDP per capita means better, easier and more convenient life on average. Okay, so pause here, take your notes. So today we talked about the four sectors, household firms, foreigners and government which all spend on GDP, that's the ex aggregate expenditure. If you divide it by the population, you get the standard of living and the GDP is the same as the national income. After taxes, it becomes disposable income for households and the taxes itself becomes the government revenue, right? And the households, they can save and part of their savings, when, if they save money, then it practically becomes funds available for the firms to borrow. The parts that I would emphasize here are the households and firms. These are the two sectors which are super important when you want to analyze the economy as we see in the future lessons. Notice that I don't have imports here. Part of it is because imports are distributed among all of the four sectors. Um, so pause here and draw a concept map for yourself. What I would say is that uh, you can write, draw your own. If you want to draw mine, you must make one major change. And major change isn't just changing the words. It should be either changing the shape of it. So you can keep the concepts, but change the shape, the way they are related, or some other major change. So try to be creative with it. It, it might take some minutes to think about it, but it really helps your learning. Let's revisit our question of the day. It's a good idea to put part of your money in the savings account. So. Take a couple of minutes and answer the questions one more time in your notes. Write at least two points for each of the three questions, the incentives, the sacrifice, and the alternative uh, before I show you the, the sample answers. Uh, notice that we, are, we talked about savings in the notes, so you might want to refer back to them. So a student answer here is an incentive is to earn interest or have future consumption. A sacrifice is current consumption uh, and the GDP, right? So you have lower GDP in the short run. Some alternatives are you can start a new business if you're a firm, that way it goes into production, or you can buy stocks of a firm. So that's also a form of saving, but not in a savings account. All right, have a wonderful day.